Hi, welcome to Pentecost Today podcast. I'm your co-host, Steve Mancini, and as always, I'm joined by the Executive Director of Pentecost Today USA, Alicia Hartle. Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you all again, and we're very excited to be together to interview a very special guest. We're here today with Father Joe Friedi in the studio and Joseph Hale, who is behind the scenes. All right. Appreciate that. Uh, as always, we like to start off by reading from Baptism in the Holy Spirit, and Alicia, you actually let me pick. So usually, usually she gives me the book, and I just read and do exactly what I'm, you know, I'm told <laughs> to do as a good a good military guy would. But uh, this time I picked, and I kind of like this one, and I think I uh, thought of our guest when I uh, picked it. So here we go. The first fruit of Christ's passion and resurrection and the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost was the birth of the church. Then as now, the Christian life cannot be lived alone, but only in communion with the body of believers established by Christ. We're going to get everyone's thoughts on that one because we're joined by a priest and obviously the executive director. So Alicia, let's start with you because we always want to start off with a prayer. But since we have a priest in the, you know, as a guest, I'll I, defer I think to we your should, judgment. We should defer to Father Joe in this case. I'll always kick him off with we'll a prayer. We'll introduce prayer. you after the prayer. That's right. <laughs> Great. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, Holy Spirit, soul of our souls, we adore you. Enlighten, guide, strengthen, and console us. Tell us what we ought to do and command us to do it. We promise to be submissive in everything that you ask of us and to accept all that you permit to happen to us. Only show us what is your will. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the gift of this time together, for the gift of our friendship, Lord, and for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And just ask that this would be a time that's fruitful for us and for anybody that would listen, that our hearts might be stirred up to just know your love, to love you more and to spend our lives loving. We ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 All right. Appreciate that. By the way, uh, before we started, we were talking about the podcast that you and a certain other gentleman who was an ex-police officer made. <laughs> I must say, you have a wonderful voice for a podcast, but you're going to have to, if you're going to do it with Frank, it's going to have to be much more forceful. <laughs> he's just going to Because he's a beast. <laughs> <laughs> That's <really. laughs> Now to introduce... Father Joe Friedi. Father Joe is the youngest of five children. He grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Father Joe played football at the University of Buffalo, where he was the starting quarterback for three years. And after college, he entered the seminary and was assigned to study in Rome at the Gregorian University and the John Paul II Institute. He was ordained in 2008, and Father Joe served for years as the vocation director and he is currently working with Divine Grace Parish, and he is also president of Dry Bones Ministry. So Yippers, welcome. Yeah. Welcome. Thanks, thanks. It's, so, it's uh, wonderful to be with you guys. Yeah. I have to start off, though, by asking, parli italiano? Si. Adesso sto parlando en lo spagnolo. Oh. Thinking in Spanish because I studied like <laughs> midway. It was a bad idea. Like between my second and third year, I came, you know, they gave us like one break to come home to Pittsburgh. This was back in the day. And I came home. My mom was not happy because I was like, I'm going to go study Spanish in Mexico. First time I've been home in two years. And she was like, you're what? <laughs> so I was like home for a day then in Guadalajara studying Spanish. So my uh, Spanish teacher used to get really frustrated. I know we didn't come to talk about this, but because I could understand what she was saying in Spanish and I would answer her in Italian and she could understand me. And she was like, you're not learning anything. <laughs> I'm like, but it's a lot of fun. But quando means quando. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, that's good. Were you fluent before you went over there? No, my gosh, not even no, close. I wasn't, fl- I wasn't fluent after five years when I returned either. <laughs> but we, so we lived at the North American College. It was a big college of Americans. All they're studying, then we would take our classes in Italian. So I think we just spoke too much English, you know, to each other for, for a lot of the day. It kind of defeats the purpose of immersion. By the way, this is actually part of the routine where we actually get to know the person. We just got to know that you learn some Italian, yeah. that makes you a good guy. Then you went to Spanish. <laughs> you know, the problem is I was thinking about taking Spanish. Okay. But I'm like, oh, I don't know Italian that well. And I'm thinking, oh, I But you see. speak Italian. See. Si. Okay. How abbastanza bene. Okay. And what's the. What's the connection, or how's the? I don't know. A last name like Mancini. You know. <laughs> <laughs> just throwing, just throwing well, it out there. <laughs> Actually, it, well, it's funny because I didn't learn. I didn't learn until later, though, in life. So I mean, I, I can remember a few words here and there. You know, just from growing up. I grew yeah. up in Bloomfield. Oh, okay. So there you go. So, so right, that's the where connection. the Italian. And then later on in life, I decided to just kind of really wanted to 
put both feet in and go. And That's cool. It. Which is harder as you get older? I, you know, learning, I'm told. I'm not learning, older. learning more harder, especially when you go back for a doctor when you're almost 50 years old and you're like, oh, oh boy. That was, <laughs> That was that was not fun. But anyways, enough about me and enough about uh, enough about you now. No, uh, <laughs> no. Um, let's let's kind of start off though. You know, one of the things a lot of the the guests we have on they all talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and this whole experience. Did you grow up Catholic? Like like di- when I say Catholic, I mean there's a difference. There's... Catholic, Catholic. You're yeah. talking about Catholic right. twice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I grew up in one of those very Catholic homes. Yeah. Now was it the baptism of the Spirit type Catholic, or just we went to church every day? We did the we you know. It was the baptism all... in the Spirit type Catholic. So I kind of tell a few different versions of my my uh, my vocation story, my growing up story, which I think they're all kind of accurate. There, there's a lot of things there, but yeah. So grew up in the charismatic renewal, and it, you know I was kind of joke around when I share my story and. Mass was not optional for me on Sunday. Like, if you wanted to live past 10, you went to Mass on Sunday, right? And we'd pray the rosary, you know, all the time. So, super Catholic family. And I'm in, in one of the, I just feel really blessed. I'm the youngest of five, and, and all my siblings are, are just on fire, which, you know, it seems to be quite rare. I know that's the case also for the Hartles. But I think because, because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because we were around the charismatic renewal, so it was a dynamic faith that Jesus Christ was a real person who, who was a, who was still alive and still working in our lives. So I think I, I always go back to this one line. I love it. Um, a guy named Anthony Esselin, I said it, probably copying somebody else, but he said, the one who captures the imagination captures the child. And so I was, or we could say capture the person, but I was just captured when I was a young kid. I grew up reading the scriptures and listening to focus on the family and going to these prayer meetings. I was make fun of Father John Sweeney, like the old plastic red binders, you know, like back in the 70s um, that we all had. And yeah, you just, you know, tons of kids everywhere, just running around all over the place and like celebration. And it was just, you know, real dynamic kind of growing up. At the same time, I didn't really understand my faith, my Catholic faith, that is. I didn't understand the why behind the what. So it was a little bit of a both end. It was like, God is real. God is amazing. God is alive. But like, huh? What, what happens at Mass? I'm really bored. Now, when you graduated high school, you went to Buffalo, not not thinking priest at that time? I, so, again, it's a little bit of a two thing. I I don't ever remember a time that I didn't know I wasn't meant to be a priest. Like, people say, when did you have your vocation? And it was like, it was like the same time I got my skin. You know, like, I was just, it was just, I was just born with it. I knew God made me to be a priest. But I think because I knew God made me to pre- be a priest, I did a little bit of the St. Augustine, you know, like, Lord, give me give me chastity, but not yet. But, but for me, it was like, Lord, I'll, I'll do priesthood. But like when I'm 23, because I want to I wanna go play football and all these other things. And so I, I always knew I was called to be a priest. But I think, you know, I, I came close to losing it. I came relatively close to marriage in college and kind of had a kind of conversion. But I always, always knew I was meant to be a priest, even when I was, you know, kind of like I was two and a half years into a relationship and and then the vocation director was you know I started to feel the call of the priesthood started going to the vocation director and I was like am I called to be a priest deep deep down in my heart I just knew it just knew it now that's true because you know when you're in a relationship a lot of people say what's well, not you it's me and it really was you because you were <laughs> you weren't getting married and I mean I how, like, did, yeah. how, how did she take that uh, it was really difficult for both of us, and uh, you know, it's. It, I mean, two and a half years—a long time. I yeah, mean, and, and this was twenty years ago. So it, you know, now looking back, I'm like, oh my gosh, Lord, like I have so much to be forgiven for, and so much to be healed for, and so yeah, it was it was very very hard, and this was a hard thing because you know what, there was a real sense of of you know being in love, and so I remember when the, the when the call started to come, it was like like Joe, come and follow me as a priest, and I was like, mm, no. <laughs> it's not happening. So, I can't. I got a game Friday. <laughs> right, exactly. So huge, huge tug of war. But there was just so much healing and so much love and so much truth. Like, I knew it. Like, oh, I knew it. And then when I, I became the vocation director in Pittsburgh, and I would kind of experience these cases, you know, of, of guys that knew they were called, but it was like, oh. And it's like, but Father Joe, am I called? And I'm like, well, I'm not going to tell you, but I, it seems to me you know. And they're like, oh, you know, so. They yeah. just don't want to answer it. I mean, is that ultimately? I mean, it's like I got to give up what I want. Yeah, right. And and what does this mean? And you know, I think it's 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 easier if you're not dating and you're not in a career. So I think some of these guys that you know, I wasn't a guy in a career, but I was a guy that was dating. 
a lot of these guys, you know, some of the vocations at 26, 27, 28 years old guys, you know, a friend of mine who was an accountant for years and doing, it's like, man, this is, this is, this is tough stuff once you get a little bit older. So I think, I think nowadays when you ask guys, so I'm, I'm 44, I think if you ask guys basically 50 years old and younger, you get a vocation story. Like how did this vocation, you guys know, comes from Bogari, which means to call, or in Italian, Bogari. So, voce. Voce. The, the voice. voice, yeah. So uh, there's a story, and I think not, not that older guys don't have a story, because they, they certainly do, but it, it's, to me, a little bit of a different story. I, when I hear guys who are 70 and above tell their vocation stories, it's like, you know, either we went in out of eighth grade or we went in out of high school, and, you know, now you, when you ask guys under 50 or under 40... Oh, you mean the way they actually selected the priests back then? Well, the way that guys entered the seminary. Oh. Like, how did you enter the seminary? Well, for me, I, I, you know, girlfriend, football, blah, blah, big story, my buddies, stories, you know, and I think when, when guys are a little bit older, you do have those kind of stories, but often it's just like, well, you know, and then, then after eighth grade, I entered the seminary. So I think there's a there seems to be a bit of a difference. I know I'm speaking in great generalities, but yeah, maybe maybe a different sense of a call. Father Joe, you know it's it's been beautiful to see your work not only as a vocations director with my brother, you know, walking with him and to see that discipleship, really loving, caring, and supporting those who are maybe making a, a difficult uh, or sacrificial decision Mm -hmm. um, that's massive and and does impact the rest of their lives Um, and you know I think it's it's beautiful to see how whether it was as vocations director or in working with the Diocese of Pittsburgh now working with a parish there is that grace of walking with the Lord as you walk with those you're shepherding Mm -hmm. Uh, but it would be great to hear from you how kind of those those first experiences that you had as a child, as a little one, walking in the renewal, having this experience of, Lord, you have captivated my imagination. Mm-hmm. You know, you have me. Yeah. How how did those seeds that were planted, how have you seen those kind of be unfolding in your day-to-day ministry? Yeah, I think um, it's just a great, really great question. I think that's never, I've never lost, like Jesus Christ is the most interesting man who's ever lived. And it's like, so that's never left me. So if I'm a priest and I'm not, if he's not the most interesting man to me, I'm going to have a lot of trouble conveying that. So I, I've never lost the, the stories or the narrative or my love for them. And I, you know, like you just mentioned, that those were seeds planted from a very young age. So this, this kind of intense interest in him has caused me to fall more and more in love with him and then hopefully has, has helped me to communicate some of that to people. You know, it's like we, you know, if Taylor Swift just had a movie come out right in the theaters, which is apparently just her concert or something like that. But it's like if you get into Taylor Swift, you read everything about her, you read all the bios, you read, a, you know, and it's like if we get interested, and I know you guys have done that, which I'm going to just compliment you on. But <laughs> Joe, Joe is a huge fan of Taylor Swift. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think I think because... Because Jesus was introduced to me at such a young age through the renewal and through everything I'm talking about through the scriptures most especially, I've all, I've just yeah I've been fascinated by him, and it's like hopefully that fascination has poured out through you know every everything I do in the ministry. You know it's funny way it's funny you say that Jesus is the most interesting man you ever know. I remember this is probably like ten years ago and it was my boss. And we were just, you know, chit-chatting at work. So he says to me, oh, if you could go back in time and meet, if you could meet anybody back in time, who would you meet? And I said, Jesus. And it kind of stopped him in his tracks because mm-hmm. he thought I was going to say something like Einstein. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Why would I want to meet them? Yeah. I want to meet the guy that literally changed the world. Yeah. Like, that's who I want to meet. So I've never heard anybody say he's the most interesting man. I always think of that commercial. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> the Dos Equis guy, the most interesting man it's in the world. Him. And, like, why is the Dos Equis man the most interesting man in the world? Because he's traveled all over the place. and he's right. like, But it's like, well, this, one, this other one's God. Right. <laughs> so it's uh-huh. like, if God became a man, I would be in. What did he do? What did he look like? What did right. he say? How did he treat people? And then you read the Gospels, and it's like... Holy cow, like... And the, I, and the time frame that he's doing that is the biggest thing. I, I think people get... They do not understand what life was like 2,000 years ago 
and the time and the moment when he is doing and saying what he is saying. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, I think context is lost, which mm -hmm. is why I think a lot of Christians don't fully appreciate that statement. He's the most interesting man. Because what he's saying is, is like, at that time, was like, whoa, like, yeah. well, you can't say that. And yeah, he's yeah. like, oh, yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's so important, like, to not, you know, obviously Jesus was a historical figure, but he is alive today. So it's so important to, you know, he's really interesting. Let's read his bio. It's in the Gospel right. of Mark, you know. <laughs> it's like he's alive today. But, yeah, I remember reading one time on a plane. I was flying from here to California, from Pittsburgh to California, and I read the Gospel of John. It just straight through, which I had never done before. I'd done that with the other Gospels. And I remember just being like, oh, that's why we need mountains and hills and valleys and deserts and rainforests and stars and galaxies and, and religious orders and Carmelites and Franciscans and celibate and married. And like, because they're, in order to get a picture of this man's face, you have to have everything. Like, he is so mysterious. And that's why I love Pope Benedict said one time, you know, he was explaining why we use incense. He was talking about, you know, let our prayers arise like incense before you, O Lord. But he said we also use incense because it obfuscates the vision and it helps us remember that we don't see God perfectly. Like if, you know, which St. Augustine would say, if you figured God out, you don't have God. You know, like he's so mysterious. And that's what, yeah, that's what, like, pick up and read the Gospels. Don't just rely on God's spell or even the Chosen or, you know, Jesus Christ Superstar. It's like read the Gospels, you know, if we can with, with kind of new lenses. Like, I'm going to discover, Jesus, help me, show me who you are. And then you read a Gospel and you're like, holy cow, like, now I have a lot more questions. By the way, um, it, it is funny you mentioned a couple of movies and TV shows there. I, I've heard priests... There are priests that have said, I don't want to watch those because they'll give me a vision that I don't, that's not accurate. Mm -hmm. Do you encourage, you know, you're, you're out there obviously working with a lot of folks. Yeah. The intent of these things is usually a good intent. And we're trying to put some things in there and give you kind of a visual and mm -hmm. entertain you at the same time, but maybe enlighten you a little bit, maybe make you curious enough to go pick up the Bible. Yeah. Do you ever have that conversation with others that say, I don't want to do it? Yeah, for sure. And I, I, I watched, I think, the first ep the series of The Chosen, but I haven't watched those. No, you know, specific, you know, reason for that. Like, I'm not going to watch it or something. But I've just seen so much fruit come out of The Chosen. And what, what it's, I watch it, too. That's okay. What, I was what it seems to me is to be imaginative prayer. But I think there is a danger in imagining Jesus as Jim Caviezel because of the passion. You know, so every, whoever said this, I don't know, but every translator is a traitor. So somebody's giving you their translation of him. Interesting. So, you know, it's like, I think there are things like, I think the Chosen's more accurate than Godspell. I think the Chosen more accurate than Jesus Christ Superstar. So if, if I take your picture and then I get five people to paint it, well, some are going to be more accurate than others. So I think the Chosen has, has been, you know, a well-produced, much more accurate picture of Jesus. But I keep telling them, the Chosen is changing my it's life. It's not a documentary. It's, it's not a, a historical fiction. And read the Gospels. Like, we have to read the Gospels. I no doubt God is working through the Chosen. I love it. But read the Gospels because we need our image of who this man is corrected. And by the way, last thing uh, I want to mention, though, it, it, again, I have older Catholics that say, I was taught not to read the Bible. There are still people that think they're not supposed to read the Bible because yeah. they're afraid I'll misinterpret it. Yeah. I mean, what do you say to them? Well, I think there, in a certain sense, we can misinterpret it. Oh, absolutely agree um, with that. You could really go off, but read the Bible in the context of the church. What do I mean by that? We have Father Mike Smith's Bible in a year. We have the Catechism of the Catholic Church. You have the Magisterium. It's the great gift of the church is the Magisterium. So um, absolutely read the Bible. Just make sure we have we have an authority. We and have that, an authority. Yeah, I think any of those passages, like you said, if if you read the Gospel of Mark, if you read one of the Gospels, you're probably going to come away with even more questions. But you've encountered the living God, and yeah. usually that's how the Lord is piercing our heart and inviting us to wrestle with the Lord with those questions. Yeah. You know, to come into deeper relationship. You know, we we have a lot of people joining us who serve as leaders in the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. Mm -hmm. I think we're we're at reaching around 35 countries, hence wow. hence the need for all the languages today. Yes. Um, <laughs> We've reached two. Certo, certo. <laughs> <laughs> our Spanish, our Italian, yes. But, you know, I think it is one of the great gifts of the renewal that Scripture kind of came to the forefront 
that when people receive the grace of baptism in the Holy Spirit, there was this incredible hunger and thirst for the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And even because of that yielding to the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. the grace of the Spirit interpreting and bringing understanding in the heart and the mind and, and really lived out in the life in ways that are extraordinary, extraordinary. So many people, you know, I'm always meeting people from all over, and I just think, oh, Lord, so many of these people are so holy, Mm -hmm. so humble, so uh, Christ-like. And oftentimes I learn that they have this incredible love for the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And not only do they read it, but they study. Mm -hmm. You know, they're Mm -hmm. they're diving into Hebrew. They're, They're diving into... Yeah, just going deeper and really looking at what does the church teach and taking those next steps to to really know Mm. the person of God more deeply. Absolutely, and that's my experience as well. And I I feel like right now, you know, a lot of people, oh, the charismatic renewal peaked in the 70s. The charismatic peaked in the 80s. And I'm like, no, like, don't. That's not it. There is no peak. Like, we're not. This isn't. But right now is such an extraordinary time in the charismatic renewal and Pentecost, all this. Because we have these scripture, you know, I, I feel like there has been a union and a purification that has to happen with any movement that is happening. We have, it's the greatest time in the world to be Catholic. It's like we have more resources and more extraordinary scholars who are living in the heart of the church to teaching us than we have or have before. Well, let me ask you, though, because I'm going to give you a good example. So when I went and got my doctorate, I went to a Christian school. I went to Liberty. Mm-hmm. I used to teach, though, part-time at a couple of Catholic universities. Mm -hmm. And the irony was, I remember I was taking a tour of one of the schools, and I won't say it. And and the individual said to me, they they always just relaxed the rules, and now they can have, you know, in the the dorms and a few things. I was like, I said, I thought this was a Catholic school. And she says, well, it's Catholic in Little C. And I thought, well, that's kind of, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'm thinking Liberty. Yeah, I'm not selling, singing their praise. It's a good school. Yeah. But, you know, their motto is training champions for Christ. Mm. And every class that you have, you have to incorporate something from the Bible from in, into, your, like, into your homework, into your project. You have to have something where you've got to go pick that Bible up and read it. Mm. Now, you said something really important because I agree with you. There are a ton of resources. By the way, I'm doing the, Mike, the Father Mike Schmidt's Bible in a year for the second time. Because wow. I feel like every time I go to learn it, what I do is I put it on before I bed. Sometimes I'm just tired, I fall asleep. So, you know, but I'm doing <laughs> it again. But it's but it's a, but it's good because now you 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 read a little bit, he interprets it for you, gives you the context which yeah. is lost, you know, and you're like, okay, I get it because there are things in the Bible that are just tough to hear, and you think, whoa, loving God, my arse, you know, mm-hmm. this guy was pretty mean, mm-hmm. and then you're like, oh, I got it. Yeah. You got to keep reading, and you got to pull it out from here, and then it makes sense, but. The problem, though, and, and or I should say the question is, then why? I'm not saying there's a difference between Catholics getting baptized and saying, well, there's billions of Catholics out there versus Catholics that are sitting in the pews on, th- on Sundays really digging into the faith. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we're shuttering churches is twofold. One is there's not enough clergy to handle these. Well, why aren't there enough clergy? Because there's not enough people choosing that lifestyle. Well, why aren't there enough people choosing? Because they're not being fed. They're not being spiritually grown they're not being encouraged yeah. and then the other the other simple fact is is that people just don't believe i mean look how many catholics do not believe that the eucharist and is the body and blood and soul divinity of, of jesus christ mm-hmm. so there's an education problem somewhere in the church yeah. the charismatic movement is one of the i'm going to call it for a lack of better terms one of the more livelier movements i say that in the right way right. meaning it's they're out there going no 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 this is real he's alive yeah. it's it's out there how do you get the message out, though, to the Catholics that are either Catholic in name only or just like, yeah, I went to church on Sunday, I'm good? What's the approach? What's the secret? I think it's a huge, I mean, that's a huge question. But, you know, I think this, what you're doing is the secret and not to, you know, patronize you guys. No, 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 please, more. <laughs> <laughs> you're the best. Everybody give money, $5 if you, by the end of the hour. Um, but, no, it's like Pitts, I'm a Pittsburgher, so I'm going to quote Bill Belichick. You good know, you. in the Patriots. He it's is a good coach. Miserable. Wish you, we had one. You can't deny it. But it's like, do your job. You know, in a certain sense, it's like, what is the area that you've been given that the Lord has has, has given you to govern? and to Like, let's go there. And a renewal is, you know, we need a renewal in the priesthood. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying my, my, the other priests need to renewed. I'm like, I need renewed. Like, I need set on fire. So, 
yeah, at least like how do we change it? Sorry, go ahead. I I remember. So this is this is years ago, but I remember being a parishioner at St. Paul's Cathedral and witnessing just because my brother was friends with Father Joe just witnessing little remarks of like, you know, I've just been so thirsty to be renewed that I'm, I'm driving to these prayer meetings with the people of God. Mm-hmm. And then soon after that, inviting people to come together to pray. Can you share a little bit about how you as a priest were thirsting and then just as you were led by the Holy Spirit kind of came into embracing that thirst? As far as like the Oakland Prayer Group or, yeah, yeah, so... I think in seminary, I just had great friends in seminary, and um, I was involved with a religious order that was just on fire, and so whatever was in me was just stoked and stoked, and and the embers just, you know, caught more and more fire, and then I think my passion is the people in the pews who have been going to Mass, who have no idea why they're there, you know, have been kind of toughing it out, and all the statistics say that most people leave the church not because of some dramatic or terrible thing that happened to them. We know those cases are there, and they're horrible, sad. Overwhelmingly, the, the numbers of people who leave the church leave because they never knew why they were coming in the first place. So it doesn't look like, Father yelled at me in confession, and I've never been right. back. Now, that there's those cases. But statistically, those are fewer. Most people start practicing their faith because they never knew why they were practicing in the first place. They, you know, the old saying, we've been sacramentalized but not evangelized so you know when I was ordained a priest it was like you just see you know it's like you just see you look out on Sunday and you're like I can't believe these people are still here they're they're dying in the pews like they're just dying here and so it's like Jesus cries out I thirst I remember being at in St. Bernadette's in Monroeville that was my when I first came back to Rome and I was going back to Rome at a six-week stint and I remember it was the closing song, and I was standing in front of the crucifix, you know, before we genuflected to leave. And I was, like, just really taken by these people. These beautiful people of faith. And I just sensed the Lord saying deeply in my heart as I looked up at the crucifix. Everybody was singing, you know, whatever the song hymn was. And I just heard the Lord say deep, like, deep in my heart, I thirst. Like, I thirst for these people. And so just experiencing the thirst thirst of Jesus to be known and to be loved. I think it, it was a little bit of an experience of St. Paul. The love of Christ urges us on. It's like me being loved by Christ urges us on, but the desire of Christ to be loved and, and the understanding that he really is the way. Like what we have going for us right now, I don't know if I've answered your question at all, but I'm having fun talking. Um, <laughs> you know, that's what matters. That's what most matters <laughs> is me. It's what was I just saying? Oh, the way that you, like what we have going for us is the data. It's like this is a really great opportunity for evangelization because it's going really bad out there. Whether you're a Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, or somewhere in between or whatever, everybody's looking and saying the same thing. Things are bad. So it's like, great. Now we come in and go, hey, like, why don't we try Jesus? Like, we try- I had somebody say to me the other day, it was beautiful. This guy just, you know, mid-20s, totally honest and just said, Father Joe, like, I'm ready. Like, I look at the last 10 years, and it has not gone well. I, I just, I want, I'm going to try and, I want to try and follow Jesus. He was literally looking at the data of his life and going, I tried it my way, it went bad. Let me try Jesus. And that's kind of the point. When people, for whatever reason, they're walking away, but what are they walking into? And, and that's, does your life better now? Okay, I don't mm-hmm. go to try, I'm not going to get up. Everybody blames COVID for, for mass attendance. Mm-hmm. I, I think you nail it, though. When I couldn't go... And now I can go. I'm like, well, why? Yeah. What, what changed in my life? Because my life is literally the same. Yeah. And nothing's changed. That's exactly. Right. But that's the whole problem or the challenge. And we, we can be instruments, but we're ultimately not the doers. God is the doer. He works right. through us. So we're the instrument. So fundamentally, is it just a question of there's not enough instruments? Because how do you get those pews not just full with people, but filled with people that are, to your point, on fire? Like, I know why I'm here, I know what's in the tabernacle, and I want to be here. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you said that, because I was just praying my holy hour this morning, and I, I um, was praying with the harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. And I realized, like, am I really laboring? 
the Lord has shown me recently, like, you know, because everybody looks at me from the outside, oh, Father Joe, you're doing so much, oh, 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 you better slow down. It's all priests ever hear is you're doing too much. And it's like, no, stop saying that to your priests. We've told our priests, oh, poor father, oh, poor father, oh, poor father. And so we've you're become, father. we've become poor fathers. It's like, there's nothing harder than being married with a bunch of kids. So don't, you know, this idea that priests have the hardest job in the world is just not true. All of our lives are tough. All of us are working hard. We all have a cross to bear. We all have crosses to bear. We all should be living sacrificially. But boy, I I just realized I am the wicked and slothful servant. Like, and the Lord opened my eyes a little bit and was like, wow, you've started to believe that you're working harder than anybody else or your hearts. So it was, you know, it wasn't the Lord obviously not condemning, but calling me on to more. Like, you can be a laborer. So I think those of us in the field have to, like, we need a conversion. We need a labor. Now, what about the... So let's talk to the people that are listening and say, you know what? I want to get involved. But when I go to my church, there's nothing really there. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to be a little stereotypical. Great. But, but, you know, you got an older priest. Maybe he's even retired. Or maybe you got a, you know, a middle-aged priest and the, and the guy helping him is retired because there's nobody there. And they're, maybe they got three churches that have combined. To your point, it it's, might not even be a lack of desire. It just might be like... Simply logistically, I can only do these things because I'm, you know. So now you got people out there saying, "Hey, I want to do more," I, but I don't know where to begin. Mm-hmm. So what do you, what do you tell people like that? Because I do think there are people that want to do more; they just don't know what to do. Yeah, I I think to pr- you know pray and pray and pray and pray and say say to the Lord, "Here I am, like use me," and then see what, see what happens. But what we're finding right now, at least you know, I can mostly only speak to Pittsburgh, though I travel a lot. But is communities are are congregating around parishes that have life and so you know that ends up being i can name about eight or nine off the top of my head in pittsburgh which i will not do but it's like and so so people are they're looking they're looking and and they're going you know what i'm done because i drive 15 minutes to the store i'm going to drive 15 minutes to that church because i got five kids or two kids and i can't take them to this church anymore because it's killing the faith of my children. I'm going to take them over there. So that's a real strong discernment and people would be real strong against that, but it's just the way it is. It's happening. Yeah. You know, I remember as, as children, my father, after mass, we're all little ones. Uh, he, he stopped us. So we're, we're standing in the back of the church and people are starting to filter out of the church. And my, my father said, kids, do you see these people? Yes. And he said, some of these people are following Jesus and some are not. Mm. Some of these people will spend eternity with Jesus and some will not. Wow. And even here in the church, this too is our mission field. Yes. And so I think there's, there's something for, regardless of our vocation, if we have been baptized, we have a call to, to be evangelists. Mm-hmm. And I think there's maybe a temptation that even as a little one, no, everyone's in church. We're all you know, we're all saved. Well, we're in the church. I call that the checkbook and, Catholics. They, they, they go, check. I've been there yeah. Sunday. Check. I check. And that's, I did my one hour and I'm done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, I've, I fell into that for years. I mean, yeah. I'm not, I'm guilty of it too. And, and those checkbook Catholics aren't coming anymore. Well, that's So problem. in a certain, so it's like those people, they used to stick around. Now they're not sticking around so much. So in a certain sense, what Pope Benedict prophesied is becoming true. You know, it's the church is smaller. It's going to be stronger, filled with more faith. But what you were saying, Alicia, was, you know, it's, it's Sherry Waddell's forming intentional disciples. We, we've just kind of looked at our pews and we realized, oh, we, we thought everybody was following Jesus. Or we might not even have thought everybody was following Jesus. But, like, that is not being taken for granted anymore. In my opinion, the church is is. You know, the church in the United States is waking up. I, people can fight me on that, it but is. it just seems like, you know, there's too many amazing, I, there's too many amazing movements going on in the church in the United States. And I know compared to the masses, it might be a pebble in a, in a big lake, but man, there's a lot of great things going on. It's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. We meet with people from all around the nation. Some are involved with renewal centers, offices, prayer groups. You name it, uh, it's pretty diverse. But it was awesome to see that while the time of COVID was incredibly difficult for many, many different ministries, there were so many who pressed in Mm -hmm. during that time 
and the fruits are so extraordinary. And they, they continue pressing in, but there are new ministries and there's new life. And even, you know, we see that pretty much across the board, even throughout parishes, suddenly everyone has the ability to broadcast the Mass, you know, on, online. And, um, and there's this extraordinary furthering of the kingdom of heaven, even as the darkness gets darker and even as we see kind of an exodus in many ways. It's exciting that we have to go out and, uh, and witness to our neighbor, witness to our coworker, witness to our friends and family. Amen. It's funny you say that because I still, th- I, I think like the camps are getting more defined. There are those who are, I call it both feet in. They're all in. They're living the life. They're trying. They're, they're trying to stay on the path. And then there's the others. And I think it's getting more clear. And, you know, again, I read the Bible. I'm not an expert, but but there are things that make it very clear that there's going to be, you're going to have your choices. It's this goes back to, we talked about this before with the lukewarm. Mm. I think lukewarm faith is probably more dangerous because at least if you have no faith, you know where you stand. If you have full faith and you're all in and you're living and you're trying, and it, you know where you stand. But if you are lukewarm, you're, you're deceiving yourself. You, you probably see a lot of that. How, how, do you, how do you know and how do you address that? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, in my, it's my life too. Like I feel like I had a you know, I'm going through a conversion recently, and a, another priest really challenged me. Another guy named Father Dan Larry, who's a DC priest and served in Mexico. I mean, just really extraordinary story. But I was pretty blind because it's like, okay, we get to a plateau. I mean, like, yeah, you know, I'm like, I'm not in mortal sin. I feel, I feel like I'm a pretty good guy because I'm evangelization stuff going on, you know. And then I see this other, and I'm like, oh, you know, it's like oh, I got a long way to go. Right. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Based on Jesus, you know, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. But I think it's the the understand like the idea that I'm a I'm a really good guy and you know so so I'm in a good place and really you're you're spiritually dead it, the danger of the lukewarm is yes contentment so I don't know how do you address that I think with parish missions with Advent revivals we're doing one at my parish right now with speakers with dynamism but you know it. Uh, it is a lot, so much is on the priest. You know, people say all the time, oh, you priests are amazing. You're doing so wonderful. You're doing so incredible. And I kind of want to say, like, if we're doing so amazing, why are we closing all of our churches and why the parish is like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I didn't want to say anything, but, uh, I, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and I put, you know, I put the figure of myself first, cause, but it's like, can we, can we challenge? Can it we always starts, look, it always starts at the top of any organization, and the church is no different. And yeah. if the very top of the organization isn't leading, yeah. Then it's going to roll downhill. Yeah, and the, you know, I forget who uh, some holy person said this. If the priest, and I want to remember, but it's like if the priest is holy, the people will be good. If the priest is good, the people will be lukewarm. If the priest is lukewarm, the people will be bad. You know, so it's like it, it, it's, yeah. a lot has to do with, you know, yeah, if we are the pastors. Oh, I've been turned off by priests that made me want to walk away, and I've had others that say, I'm ready to walk through fire for them. Yeah. I mean, to sit there and say that the priest doesn't matter to your faith is is insane. The priest is a, is a pivotal part in your whether they understand that or not. We're human. We're looking, we're looking, and we're looking up there at the pulpit. And that guy standing up there is is ultimately the the first thing that I'm seeing and making decisions based on what they're telling me. And if they're just going through the motions, I'm thinking, well, yeah, like you said, why am I here? It, it matters. Yeah, it matters. Important. Well, we are coming to the end, but we always want to, you know, we're trying to talk about people get involved. And so one of the things we're going to be kicking off here is a nine-year novena. And ultimately the nine years ends in 2033, which is the 2,000-year anniversary of the original Pentecost. I like that you're not shooting low. Nine days. You're like, nine days? No, nine months. Nine years, baby. <laughs> nine, we years. nine years. We're going all in because nine years is a drop in the well of time, right? Don't worry. Any, it's only three hours commitment a day for the next nine years. So <laughs> just... You can do it. We'll be on the pilgrimage together. No, that's right. <laughs> that's right. No, but again, it's it's well, if you're listening and you're saying, I think I'm being called. I think I'm on fire. There are resources out there. There are things you can do. And if you don't have a strong community around you, again, we encourage you. If you can listen to this podcast, you can get online. If you can get online, please go check out the website, PentecostTodayUSA.org. There are other communities and groups out there. Start at our website. 
take a look, see what resources are out there, and we are calling you to join in the nine-year novena. It is something you can do. Be part of a larger voice to God to pray, obviously, for renewal. We're praying for the church. We're praying for the world. Considering, you know, kind of what we talked about just a second ago, or the comment you made, considering the state of the world, I don't think praying is such a bad idea, you know? Yeah. And, it, you know, as an evangelist, the call to evangelization, I love that Father Joe, you a few times just spoke about moments of being convicted by the Lord this morning, today. And so that that's the most radical witness, you know, just kind of that moment of Jesus exposing his wounds and allowing us to see them, to touch them, and to see that they've been made glorified. Mm. And um, I think there's something to this nine-year novena in that we're beginning with the first three years. We are praying for everyone who has ever received the grace of baptism in the Holy Spirit, even if they never knew what it was, Mm -hmm. that radical encounter with the Lord, that experience of God's power, God's presence, God's love, God's mercy, God's grace, that that moment is awakened and enkindled, and that there's a new and ongoing Pentecost that's set ablaze in our own hearts. <laughs> and and then specifically praying for that, for all the different realities of the renewal, and then really going out to the whole church in the next three years ablaze because we've prayed first for the Lord to set a, a new fire in our own hearts and really seeking the Lord and crying out for the whole church, the whole church, to receive a new and ongoing Pentecost so that in the final three years we can go out into the world and the Lord can set ablaze a new and ongoing Pentecost in the world. So there's there's this beautiful journey, um, you know, a little daunting maybe when we think about the full nine years, but each of those three years is so precious because it gives us, like, instead of sitting in the pews and saying, Lord, you know, what's what's happening in the church? It gives us that that focus of putting our eyes on the Lord, crying out to the Lord, knowing that we're doing that in fellowship, taking action as we do that, and and, yeah, really seeing the Lord being the one to do the work. Ultimately, the Holy Spirit being the evangelist, changing us and changing the church and the world around us. Well, we do appreciate you here, a man of many words. Uh, <laughs> I'm um, just trying to keep up with you. Oh, no, no, this is good. Uh, and again, thank you very much for joining us today. We, appreciate you coming yeah. in, you know, especially into the studio, which is an anomaly, by the way. Most of our guests call in, but uh, I bet she didn't tell <laughs> you You didn't that. give me that option. <laughs> that was part of our evil plan. Uh, Father Joe, can we ask you to give a blessing to those who are joining us? Yeah. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, you are the giver of all good gifts. So, Lord, anybody who's uh, listening, that you would just send your blessing. Send your blessing upon them, Lord, the, that the Holy Spirit might be stirred up in, in all of our hearts, that the intentions that they have on their hearts might be heard by you and might be answered. And to this day, they would know the peace and the joy and the consolation that comes from your Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, folks. Once again, I want to thank you very much for listening and tuning in. And as always, if you have a, a desire to learn more, please go out to PentecostTodayUSA.org. Again, that is PentecostTodayUSA.org. A lot more information. You can get a copy of the Baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can read about the different renewal communities in your area. And again, more information on how to join the nine-year novena. Thank you very much and have a wonderful and blessed day.